One, one of the things I love about, um, about being a follower of Jesus is that um, we've not just got connected to who God is as a father, but God has connected us and reconnected us to each other as family. And um, there is no greater gift on this side of eternity than the gift of family given to us by Christ. And, um, and so it's good to be together and to be family because of what Christ has done and the many ways that he's blessed us. And um, today I get the privilege of um, allowing myself and the rest of us to be blessed again by a, a dear friend, um, Ebony Cody. You guys give her your attention for a few minutes. She got, she's got something to share with us. The definition of hope. Hope. Definition. The general feeling that some desire will be fulfilled. Hope. Noun. Person, place, or a thing. I'm going to say that again. Hope, as a noun, is a person, place, or a thing. Hope can be a person, place, or a thing. Do you realize what this means? Hope as a person would be really uplifting, and hope as a place would be undoubtedly comforting, and hope as a thing could be quite promising. What if hope was a promise? A promise that was sure to be kept and hidden in the vessels and corners of your heart. What if hope meant being more than a prayer request and actually doing our best to spread good news to those whose view, sorry. What if hope actually meant being more than a prayer request and actually doing our best to spread good news to those whose views sway in a little different direction than me or you? What if hope meant being hospitable to friends and neighbors? or offering to serve in meaningful ways of labor? Or what if hope meant praying for those when we don't understand or know their story and then engaging in the gospel for his honor and glory? Hope is hospitality. Hope is offering to serve. Hope is praying and hope is engaging. H-O-P-E, that's exactly what we need to be. Offering, noun. Something offered as a gift or contribution. And here's where we arrive. It's in Mark 10, 45, and it says, Even as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. So not just 10 or 20, but plenty, which is an adverb meaning just as much as any. Pray. Verb. To address, call upon, or beg. This is an action to get down and bend your legs and pray to the one whose truth is shatterproof so that even safe flight repair couldn't even compare. Engaging, adjective, it means attracting or delighting and it could also mean to be inviting. When we think about hope, we think about reaching out to those in doubt who aren't quite sure of what love is all about. You see, this world is not our home, it's just a place where we eat, sleep, and roam, and our treasure isn't here just lying in a chest, it's in heaven with my Jesus and Lord, we are so blessed. So let's offer, so let's bring hope to this city with hospitality. Let's offer to serve to those who are more reserved, and don't forget to pray for strangers because without Christ they're in grave danger. And engage, it doesn't matter the age. Be that light in the dark. Be that beginning of a flame, a spark. And look up like a child reaching for a grown-up. We look to the one to cope, and his name is spelled H-O-P-E, hope. Thank you. Wow. That is amazing. (laughs) Ebony, come on, girl. Come, oh my gosh. Thank you so much. You know, I'm a little bit of a poet, too. Roses are red. <laughs> Violets are blue. That's about, that's about all I got. <clears throat> Let's pray. We'll jump right in. Father, we love you and we thank you. We thank you that you do bring hope. We thank you that we can have the hope of being understood in a world full of misunderstanding. We we thank you that we have the hope of eternity with you forever because your son died for our sin. Father, I thank you that we have the hope of being um, before you and loved by you and cared for by you, that we, we can have hope of those things. 
Father, I thank you that hope isn't just something that we experience, but it's something that you, you want us to express to the world around us. Father, I thank you for this family because they give me hope that there are greater days ahead for this city. So, Father, I ask you today, would you speak to us? Would you fill our hearts with hope? Would you show us people who we can give it away to? I thank you for this family. It's a family, a real family. We laugh together and cry together. and In doing so, we, our hearts are filled with hope. We love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. If you have a Bible, you can turn to Matthew chapter 6. We are going to be looking at the Lord's Prayer today. Um, the Lord's Prayer is probably the most prayer prayed of any prayer that's in the Bible, and it could possibly be, because of that, maybe the most understood or maybe even most overlooked. I don't know if you're like me, but the more familiar I become with something, the less I appreciate it or even sometimes understand it. At least sometimes that's true in my, in my own marriage. The jewel of a wife that I have, I, I find that often I take her for granted when there's so much more in her, there's so much more about her to discover in It's taken time to ask questions and to search her out that I really see the blessing and the benefit I have in being married to Angela uh, Lynn Marshall. The same thing is true, I think, here with the Lord's Prayer. I think that the more we today, by God's grace and with his help, the more we'll dive into it, the more we'll see clearly what Jesus is saying, and the more impact it would not just have on our lives, on our family, on our world, but we can see really how this prayer God desires for it to have an impact on the world around us. We've been in this series now for five weeks called Hope. It's the series where we're looking at experiencing and expressing the hope that's found in Jesus. At the beginning of the year, I said, Lord, would you speak to me, talk to me, teach me, lead me, guide me as I lead, guide this church family with the other leaders here. And Lord, what do you want us to do? What do you want us to know? Who have you called us to be? And he said, Covatis, your church has got to be a church of hope. Really, he said, my church needs to be a church of hope. So I said, well, Father, teach us how to, how to be a church that gives hope, that lives with hope, that understands hope, that hope isn't a philosophy, it's not a way of thinking, hope isn't just an emotion. I feel hopeful today, but hope is a person, a living, breathing man named Jesus. And he's sweet, and he's precious. There's no other man like this man. And Jesus taught us how to pray. And he said, I want you to know my father. And this is what my father's like. And this is what my father does. And this is what my father wants to do in and through you. But he'll only do it if you, if you pray. So we started a few weeks ago looking at H as hospitality. Even Ebony talked about it, and even our artwork shows us that H is kind of looking in. How do we show hospitality to friends, neighbors, and strangers? We looked at the man Zacchaeus in the Bible. And how Zacchaeus was a wee little man who climbed a sycamore tree. And as everyone was going by and Jesus was going by, Zacchaeus wanted to know Jesus. He wanted to follow Jesus. He wanted to love Jesus. But the crowds kept Zacchaeus away from Jesus. And how many of us and people out there felt like the crowd kept me away from Jesus. I don't, I don't, I growing up, I didn't have church, nice church clothes. And I didn't have the church lingo. And I didn't, I didn't feel like I fit in. And For me, the crowd kept me out. But Jesus looks up at Zacchaeus and says, Zacchaeus, you and I need to have dinner together. And so hospitality is, it's that. It's it's the Zacchaeus. Who are the Zacchaeuses in your life, in your family, on your workplace, in your school? Who are the people that maybe are looking for Jesus? They're just waiting for you to say, can we have a meal together? Can I show you hospitality? Then we looked at, oh, offering to serve and how Annie and Josiah showed two amazing pictures of serving, of giving their lives away. I'm sorry, they, they shared about hospitality, but, but then uh, Josiah shared a story about serving and giving his life away to the guy at the dump truck. And then David shared that week about serving the homeless and the hungry. And David, I was startled by it. I was shocked by it. I was encouraged by it when David said, I would pick them up off the streets, homeless people. And I wouldn't take them to McDonald's queue. I took them to a steakhouse. 
And I sat with them eye to eye. I didn't give them a few dollars and keep moving, but I, I, I dignified them with a the meal to share a meal with them, to eat with them, to serve them. And now that's the hope of the gospel, that like you and me, we, we all are in need of someone to serve us. And Bob shared about how he's serving at AA meetings, and that's just a practical way in his everyday life where he's serving people around him. And today we, we're looking at, looking at P. I call to be a people of prayer that there is no such thing as a church that, that doesn't pray. There is no such thing as a believer that doesn't pray. Because at the heart of Christianity is this idea. I was separated from God because of my sin, because I rebelled against God. And so there was a break in the relationship and Jesus Christ came in between heaven and earth. And he brought me and the Father together again. And now the greatest gift given to me as a believer of Jesus is I get to talk to God. Have you considered that? I talk to God. That is mind-blowing. God, Genesis 1, spoke. The world swore. Light, stars, quasars, moon, suns, Mars. He says, I'll bend my ear to hear your voice if you speak to me. So then that gives me hope because I'm not in this thing alone. Even when everyone else leaves me, God's still for me and with me. And today we, we want to talk about how that brings us hope as individuals and how we can give away hope by prayer. And then next week we'll look at how do we engage people with the story of the gospel in warm and whimsical ways. You guys ready to, to jump in? So prayer, what is prayer? Simple definition for prayer. Here's how I would like to define prayer. Prayer is this, an ongoing conversation with our Father who's in heaven. That's prayer. There's all kind of places that you can talk to God. You can talk to God on the morning. Some folks like to get on their knees. Denzel Washington said that every night he puts his slippers in the middle, underneath his bed, all the way in the middle. He pushes them all the way towards the middle of his bed. He says, because then every morning when he gets up, he's got to get on his knees to get his slippers. And while he's there, he communes with God. Some of us need to put our slippers under our bed. But the, the, the place isn't as important as the person that you're talking to. I love to talk to God when I'm driving. My best and favorite time to talk to God is in the shower or on the toilet. It's just me and him there. Present ongoing conversation with our Father. I believe Jesus teaches us from the, from the Lord's Prayer, as it's called, that we can, through prayer, connect with God. We can um, um, release his plans or establish his plans on the earth. Prayer does that. Prayer isn't just for relationship. God actually uses prayer to further his kingdom, to expand his kingdom. And not only that, but we can be secure in the promise that God will rule and reign on this planet. And prayer is a great reminder of that, that there's one God and Father, there's one Son sovereign king over all the universe, and we have front row access to his throne whenever we ask him. He rules, he reigns, his kingdom will come, his will will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That, my brothers and sisters, is a guarantee. Therefore, we can have hope. So I want to today, in the few minutes that we have together, I want to look line by line. I want to go verse by verse at what Jesus says in the Lord's Prayer because here's the big idea. Jesus connects prayer to the nature and character of God. And the good news is this, God is a father. That's who he is. So while we think maybe he's a judge and he's a savior or, or he's angry or, or he's upset or he's the sovereign, most high, almighty God, he goes, yeah, 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 yeah. But, but listen, I'm, I'm a dad and I love you. And I want you and me to have a relationship that's deep, personal, and intimate. So we're going to look line by line at what we call the Lord's, the Lord's Prayer together. Okay. If you got a Bible, you can turn to it. It should be up on the screen. Matthew chapter 6, starting at verse 9, says this. Our Father, Jesus says, back up, verse 9, he says, uh, pray then like this. He's teaching his disciples how to pray. And Jesus starts off and says, our Father who is in heaven, 
hallowed, or that's another word for holy, is your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Father, give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us of our debts or of our sins as we also forgive those who have sinned against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. The first thing Jesus says to the disciples here in Matthew chapter 6, he says, now when you pray, when you, when you begin to have a conversation with God, he goes, the first thing that you got to know is one, that he's a father. Which means that if God's a father, that means he's relational, that means he's reachable, and that he's responsive. Jesus says, now listen, you got to know that you're not talking to someone who won't hear you, who won't react to you, and who doesn't care about you. God's a father. I mean, a a real father. I'm a a father. I, I love my children. My children are the most important thing to me on this earth next to Jesus and my wife. I love my babies. I love talking to them. I love interacting with them. I love responding to them. Now, I'm a father that's broken and and that's weak, and so I don't always get it right. I don't always do it right, but but he does, and the greatest gift I can give my children is to teach them how to talk to their father in heaven because he'll always love them. He'll always be for them. He'll always watch out for them. He'll always respond to them, and that's what Jesus says. He goes, hey, listen to me. Hope City Church, you have hope because God is a father, and he hears you. You can reach him. He will respond to you. He's never too busy. He's never too busy. There's no prayer too small. There's no prayer too small. There's there's never a time where you should ever in your heart feel like you got to go, oh, I don't really want to bother God with that. I'll just figure it out on my own. He goes, no, 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 no. No, you're my daughter. You're my son. Let me help you. I want to be a part of your life. My son's eight, and his homework assignment this weekend from his teacher was, by Monday, Jonathan needs to learn how to tie his shoes. Some of you are going, he's eight, and he doesn't know how to tie his shoes. I'm going, well, I was 20 before I learned. No, I'm I'm kidding. (laughs) I'm, I'm going to get the pleasure of sitting down with him and make a spaghetti loop, make a spaghetti loop, tie it. And he's going to make one spaghetti loop and then make a knot. And I'm not going to go, now, why don't you just figure it out? I'm going to go, nope, nope, not that way, honey. I'm going to untie the shoe, and we're going to do it again. And then we're going to do it again. And the joy that I have doing it with my son is the reward in itself. Not the outcome of the knot. Doing it with him is the reward. Prayer is its own reward, not the response of the father. The fact that you get to and he gets to interact with you and you get to interact with him, that is the reward of prayer. That's the real reward. It's relationship. It's the conversation between us and our Father in heaven. Jesus doesn't end there in Matthew chapter 6, but he goes down to verse 10, and here's what he says. Now, the first part is relational. He goes, this is who the Father is. You can know God as a person, but secondly, with prayer, you can release God's plan on the earth. What do you mean, Pastor Q, when you say that? Verse 10, Jesus says, pray also to the Father, your kingdom come, pray that your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. The the thing that I love about Jesus here is that what Jesus says is what prayer does is that prayer affects and prayer impacts God's kingdom here on earth. Jesus' younger brother James in James chapter 4 verse 2 says this, you have not because you ask not. The reality is this, church family, if we want to see that city change, it will never be changed more than the degree that we pray for it. What you want God to do on earth, you first have got to ask him to do while he's in heaven. Here's how it works. You've heard it this way. Prayers go up, blessings come down. Have you heard that before? Who's ever heard that? When prayers go up, blessing goes down. That's how it works. He goes, if you pray for me to release my kingdom on this earth, I will respond. I will release my presence. I will release my power. And I will establish my purposes on earth as it is in heaven heaven. So pray, your kingdom come, God. I ask that you would change this city, God. Well, what is God's kingdom? It's anywhere his rule and his reign is established. It's literally the king's dominion. That's what his kingdom is. 
It's where the king has dominion. So here's what we're believing in our missional community, that God's kingdom would be established at Carver, that the love of Christ, the truth of Christ, the peace of Christ, the life of Christ, the righteousness of Christ, the healing of Christ would be established in a school where 60% of the students won't graduate. I'm asking God to reveal to those students that he's a father, that they're deeply loved. And the fact that their earthly father's not there, it makes no bearing. It's no marking. It has nothing to do with the love of their father. That they're here not because their mom or their dad wanted them. They're here because God wanted them. So I'm praying, God, open their ears. God, open their hearts. When I go and I smile, let that young man, it's more than me smiling at him, but it's you smiling at him through me. That, that is the power of prayer. Not just to change my heart, but to transform the world. That's why Hope City, we've got to be a church that prays. We've got to be a people as individuals who pray. Because when we pray, God works. When we work, we work. But when we pray, God works. Jesus, Jesus goes, okay, so prayer, it's, it's relational, it's, it's God word, it's, it's this focus on God's uh, 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 grandeur, it's a focus on God's goodness. He goes, not only is it that, but prayer is also the way that I'm going to change the world around you. I'm going to use prayer first, and then I'm going to send you to be an answer to your prayer. I had a pastor tell me this way. He said, the church moves forward on its knees. We've got to remember that. That the church, God's mission, moves forward when we get on our knees. When we get on our knees and he stands tall on our behalf. That applies to your marriage. That applies to your children. That applies to your workplace. That applies to this city. That applies to your own heart. Jesus starts off with this Godward vision. Then he goes global. He goes, the kingdom will be established on the earth. And then Jesus says, prayer isn't just these big lofty things, but prayer is very personal and intimate. Let's look at it. Matthew chapter 6, verse 11. Here's what what Jesus says. He says, um, give us this day. He says, pray this. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive those who have sinned against us. One of the things I, I love here is that Jesus, I, I like um, to, my, I like to um, for me to understand things, I've got to, it's got to be um, easily to say. And so Jesus, in my mind, he, I broke it down this way, is he deals with Three things. One, sustenance. Give us our daily bread. Two, he deals with social relationships. Forgive our debts as we forgive those who sinned against us. And then thirdly, he deals with sin and Satan. He says this, lead me not into temptation and deliver me, deliver me from the evil one. So Jesus says prayers personal, prayers intimate. In prayer, we can go to the Father and say, Father, I ask you to provide for me my daily needs. Father, I ask you to get in the middle of these relationships that are rocky. He says, Father, and ultimately, I ask you to help me love you more and resist the work of the evil one. He says, Father, provide for me my daily bread. Uh, One of the things that I've found in my own personal life as a follower of Jesus is this principle. Gratefulness is the green light for God to give you more. That's how it works. Gratefulness is the green light for God to give you more. A grateful heart will be, let me say it a different way. A grateful heart will release God's generosity in your life. So every day when I pray, my first mode of operation in prayer is thankfulness and gratefulness because I know that a grateful heart, a heart that's thankful is a heart that can receive blessing. It's no different. He's a, he's a father. When your children come to you with a grateful heart for all you've done for them, it you, makes you want to do more. When they say, Mom, I'm so thankful, or, or Dad, I'm so thankful, or Man, I'm so blessed, or I'm so glad that you're my dad, I, I'm pull out my wallet and try to give away money when they talk like that. And that's, I, that's why I don't keep much cash in my wallet. <laughs> But the opposite is true, too. It shuts down the system and the flow of generosity because they have a wrong perspective about what they deserve as opposed to what I give out of my own goodness. And many of us come to God as if he owes us something. And everything's a gift. Your breath right now, you didn't wake yourself up. He did. 
I found a grateful heart. It's a generous heart. He doesn't end there. He, he then says, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And here's this thing that, uh, that's kind of been working in my heart. I love that Jesus says this. It's a hard phrase. He goes, if you forgive others, that will, be the, that will be the context for my forgiving you. So here's the big idea is that your ability to experience God's forgiveness is directly connected to your willingness to let someone experience yours. I'm going to say it again. Your ability to experience God's forgiveness is directly connected to your willingness to let someone experience yours. God will not give you breakthrough till they get theirs. He wants you to have a right understanding of grace and mercy. How could we who've been forgiven so much give so little? It's a smack in the face to the gospel. He doesn't end there. Then he goes a little further. Now, I, I know that's hard. I'm, uh, just a, the, um, I, I've had a lot of bad stuff happen to me, and I'm not saying that I've done it right or perfectly, but by God's grace, I'm aiming at it. I'm saying, God, help me to be a man who remembers how much I'm loved because he who's forgiven much will love much. And so, Lord, help me to keep that constant view that, oh, your grace found me when I hated you, when I didn't love you, I didn't want you, I was running astray, I was drowning. No one could save me. No one would. Would save me, but you did. When I was all alone, when I was lost, dazed, and confused, when I was in love with my sin and on a highway to hell, you stopped me in the middle of the road and said, This further, no more, you're mine. You belong to me. Oh God, let me never, never lose the wonder of your mercy and your forgiveness. And let me never be stingy with it and not give it away. He doesn't end there. He goes on and he goes, when you pray, just don't pray for those relationships because this applies to marriage. And so, so because for me, I'm going, okay, Lord, I'm, I'm married to a woman. She's beautiful. She's gorgeous. She's intelligent. She's super funny, but she's a human. And, and she falls short and, and I fall short. And can the married people say amen? amen? But here's a principle that I found that I'll give to you. That which you pray for, you fall in love with. Think through that for a second. The thing that you pray for, you fall in love with. Prayer has the power to preserve and to cause your relationships to prosper. As a, as a matter of fact, this truth is what caused us to plant this church in a, in a lot of ways. Because here's what happened for me. While many of you know, as a young man, I made some mistakes and ended up in prison. And for seven and a half years, I prayed for this city, even though I didn't live in it. And I'll tell you what happened in those times of prayer. I began to get God's heart for this city and that, that longing to see this city be a city of hope, that, that desire to build up this city. What happens is this, that which you build up in prayer, it's hard to destroy with your hands. And so what happened when I got out, it was, I was like, um, I was ready to come out the blocks running. I said, Lord, change the city, re, uh, renew this city, restore this city. And he said, son, I'm going to use you to be an answer to your own prayer. So what I found even in my marriage and in my relationships with, with other people, what I've begun to do over the years is with this principle is I'll tell you what I did. I'll tell you a little secret. I told it to the men of valor, and, and this is what I did. I lay siege to my wife in prayer. I didn't tell her about it, but I began to pray for her. I didn't tell her anything. I said, God, my heart's not right. I'm, I'm getting uh, easily irritated. I'm, I'm getting easily offended. My love tank is low, Lord. I need you to help me. And so I said, Lord, I'm not even going to ask her what she needs. I'm going to ask you because you're her father and you know her better than she knows herself. So I didn't even tell my wife. I started praying for her. Here's my prayer, and I give it to you. It's free. What do you see? What do you see when you see my wife? Jesus, what do you feel about my wife? Jesus, what is your plan for my wife? Jesus, how can I love my wife? I didn't tell her anything. I did this for about a month. And I would just daily, men, I'd encourage you, women too, I'd encourage you, make a little reminder in your phone. There's actually an app called Echo that you can get that will help you to, to remember to pray. And I just did that. I said, Lord, what do you feel when you think about Angela and 
There were times when he would reveal to me pain in her heart, and I would go, Lord, why does she feel pain? And he would say, her, 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 her dad hurt her, or, or you hurt her, or whoever hurt her. And, and then I would go, oh, that helps me understand her heart. Woman wants to be understood, not conquered or dominated. So I said, Lord, help me understand her to love her, not figure her out. And so what happened during that time of praying for my wife for about a month, I didn't tell her anything. One day we're sitting across the table eating dinner, and um, she says something to me, and I responded, and I don't really remember what I said, but when I said it, I remember her response. Her response was this. (laughs) How'd you know that? You've been praying for me. The father began to tell me what was in her heart because the truth is she was in the other room crying out to God about all the things she needed. And when I started going, God, what is she saying? Talk to me, God, about this woman. He said, well, I'll tell you what she's saying. (laughs) She said, you're a jerk. I went, oh, man, Lord, help me. (laughs) That which you pray for, you fall in love with, whether that be people, places, or things. Here's how Jesus ends it. He says it this way. He says, "Um, pray that you wouldn't be led into temptation, but pray that he would deliver you from the evil one. But the thing I love about Jesus here in this point, I think he's making with this prayer, is that we can pray for things, but Jesus also taught us to pray against things. Just pray against temptation. What I found is that the more honest I am about, about, about what's tempting me or what I'm struggling with, the God that provides the context for the breakthrough to happen. Prayer has the power to set your heart free. It does, I know it. Because it's happened for me. And I've watched it happen for others. But prayer doesn't just have the power to, to set my heart free. Prayer also releases the power to see other people set free. The promise of prayer is this. Jesus says it. Some translations have taken it out. I like the ones that keep it in. Jesus says, For yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And and that's how he ends it. So he gives us two bookends. He says in the opener of prayer, God is good, and he's a father, and you can trust him. And then he ends it and says, and his is the kingdom. His is the power. His is the glory. And in between those two truths is a lifestyle of prayer. It's a people who will pray over these things. And the Father says, my kingdom will be established. My glory will release breakthrough in your marriage. My power will heal your broken heart. He says, my kingdom will be established. And I will usher in righteousness, love, truth, and justice on this planet if you will pray. So to help us pray, how do we do it? I know today initially my thought was, Lord, do I give your people just practical ways to pray for others around them, like something to say or something to do? And I felt like the Lord says, well, Q, you're already doing that. Actually, this Tuesday night in this room at 6 p.m., Todd's going to teach us how to pray for people. And so I said, Lord, what kind of keeps us from praying for people? And I felt like he showed me three things. The first one is really simple, wrong thoughts about who God is. Like, I, 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 what I mean by that is I don't pray because I don't know if I'm doing it right. Or I don't pray because I don't think I'm holy enough. I, I mean, I've got too much bad stuff in my life. Like, can I, can I talk to God? And, and God would say to you, what, what daddy don't like to talk to his kids? But I don't, I don't know if, if I'm doing it right, which is the second thing I think that prevents us from praying. Is we haven't been trained or taught how, how to pray. I had to teach my son how to pray, right? You, you folks who've got kids, you have to sit down with your kids and say, da, da. And they went, da. I went, no, no, da, da. And they went, da. And they slobbered everywhere. And it was, it was awesome. You're like, oh, my God, look at the slobber. Look at the slobber. Oh. Same thing with the Father with prayer. There, listen, here's the good news. There is no wrong way to pray. It's a conversation. Standing up, sitting down, on a walk, in your car. The, the third thing, I think it's just, I don't, I don't think we make time for it. We invest in our other relationships, but this is the one we don't invest in. And this is the most important relationship. So here's something to help you. I think this will help you. It's an acronym. The acronym is PRAY. What do I do when I pray? The first one is P. 
I, I usually start off prayer with praise. I usually start off with thanksgiving, with a thankful heart. When I come to God, I, I, my first thing isn't, Lord, forgive me for my sins. The first thing I say is, Lord, thank you. And I've got a litany of things to thank him for, my wife, my kids, my health, my job, this church family, this city, his plans. I've got a litany of things to thank him for. I usually start off, Lord, thank you for today. Sometimes I do it with my eyes open. My kids don't like to pray with their eyes closed. They like to pray with their eyes open. So you don't have to close your eyes or open your eyes, fold your hands or get on your knees. It's a conversation with your father. Father, thank you for your goodness. And then what usually happens is as I'm thanking him for all the things he's done for me, usually what happens is within my heart I start realizing ways that I haven't been thankful or I haven't been a good steward of what he's given me or I haven't loved the wife well that he's given to me. And then I usually do the R, which is repent. I just go, Lord, thank you for Angela so much. Then I go, oh, Lord, I I know I, I know I haven't been patient with her lately. See how that's different from, oh, God, forgive me. I know I haven't done these things wrong. I don't come to God like a beggar. I come to him like a son. I say, Father, thank you. And I go, Father, I, I messed up. I know I did. You know I did, and I know I did, and Lord, I ask you to forgive me. Then A is advocate. Then I take a little bit of time and pray for the people around me. I'd encourage you to make a list of people, or it could be your immediately close family members, or it could be your coworkers. Advocate is just that. You get in on behalf of someone else. I've been to trial before, and I had an advocate, was a public defender. <clears throat> no comment. And, um, and he stood up and said, here's the truth about Covadas. I, I am advocating. I'm, I'm going, God, my brothers right now don't know you, don't love you, don't want you. They're in deep sin. One of them just went to prison a few weeks ago. And I'm going, God, he won't talk to you, so I'll talk to him for you. You ever had a sibling and a parent that weren't on good terms? And then the one sibling goes to the dad and goes, Dad, I know, but Johnny really loves you. He's just being a knucklehead right now. That's what we get to do with prayer, with the advocate. And then the why is simple. I yield. I just go, Lord, whatever you want, have your way with my life. That's an easy way to pray. Can I pray for us? Father, I thank you for my church family. Father, I thank you that you do. You love us. You're a good, good father. That is who you are. That is what you're like. Father, I, I pray today that, um, that maybe even for the first time that, um, for some of us, our hearts would get filled with courage to, to really believe that about you, that we can pray to you. There is no magic way or right way to pray, that, that it's an ongoing conversation with you. Father, for some of us, you are bringing people to our mind who we could be or you want us to pray for. And Father, I just right now, I agree with my brothers and sisters for those people that you would... Um, you would save them, or you would set them free, or you would remove their addictions, or, Father, you would bring healing to that marriage, or, Lord, that you bring healing to my relationships or the relationships that we have that are broken. Lord, we advocate for those people. Lord, we advocate for those relationships, people who we have not had a, been able to forgive or has been really hard to forgive. Lord, we want to we wanna forgive them. Would you help us? You're forgiving someone doesn't mean you're saying what they did was okay. It just means that you're not going to continue to let them hurt you by the unforgiveness that you carry. Lord, I pray why that you would help us to yield to you. Lord, I thank you for this family. May today they know God's my father and he loves me and he wants me. Father, bless your people till we meet again in Jesus' name. Let's all stand. Let's just sing that one chorus. This is who you are. Let's just sing that together. Yes, Lord. Who you are and I love you. who I am. It's who I am.
are some of us in the room today that you're here and you're here and maybe you don't you don't know God today as a father or or or, or you, you go Q, I, I've heard the God thing but I don't I don't know that I've connected the dots that he's a good father and he's a loving and a kind father if that's you um, I want to just invite you to come forward I would love to get you connected with my dad. He's a good dad. Yeah, and if you're on a, a leadership team of Hope City, you can come on up to receive people. For some of us, it's the forgiveness thing. That was touching our hearts. I feel like there are some of us in the room today that there are people in our lives that we need the Lord to help us to forgive. That The hurt that they hurt you with, was, it was real. And it was very painful, and it was very traumatic, and you've tried to get over it, and you just you haven't been able to. And, and I, I just wonder if it's not something that having someone else pray with you that would help you get free from it. Then for some of us, for some of us, it's, it could be daily needs. It's, man, he said he, he provide daily bread, and Lord, provide that daily bread. Or some of us, it could be, Lord, I want to be used by you to change the world. I, here's what I'm asking you today. At the end of the day, what I'm asking you is to let us love on you if you're in the room. If that's you and you just let us love on you. Let us pray for you. If you so if you're here today and you, you want prayer, you would like prayer, you need prayer, I want to invite you to come up. And while you prepare to do that, let me pray for us. Father, thank you for those who are going to come, those who you're calling. So if that's you, feel free to jump on out the aisles. Your family, this is what we do. We know each other. And if I wasn't leading this time, I'd be up here. Father, as people come, as you lead your people, Father, I ask that you would meet them. Father, I ask that you would give breakthrough. Father, I ask that you would give healing. Father, I ask that you would restore us, that you would renew us. Father, I thank you for reconciling us to yourself through the work of your son, Jesus. We love you and we need you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As the lights go up, if you're a parent, go to the back, grab your kids. If you want prayer, come on up here at any time. And we'll see you next week in this room, 10 a.m. on Sunday morning. God bless you.